Only one? Only one. All oh, right. Okay, please, you can take it now. Okay, give a smile. One, two, and three. Okay, sir. All oh, right. Uh, shall we uh, start, Mr. Taat? Because it's nine... Nine oh five now. Okay, yeah. Because I'm the moderator, so I. Yes. Okay, sir. Please. I'll try it. Uh, but uh, shall we uh, make a prayer before we start our session? Please, sir. Yes. I'll try. It. <clears throat> uh, can I have uh? Leonard Siregar to lead our prayer, please. Could you please? Oh, Pat Leonard is. How about uh, Sir Emilius German? Can you please lead our prayer for today before we start our session? Oh, uh, okay. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's take a moment to start the prayer. So uh, the prayer time start. That's it. Yeah. Prayer time finish. Thank you. Thank you. Go back to you. Now. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's no problem, sir. Thank you, Sir Amelius Chairman. All right, so we open. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, all. We are delighted to welcome you to our conference named the First Asian EFL Journal, Universitas Christian Indonesia's Second Language Accusation Research International Conference hosted by English Education Department, Faculty of Letters, and Languages and Institution of Research and Community Services, or LPPM, of Universitas Christian Indonesia, in collaboration with TESOL Asia. The theme of our international conference is English Second Language Accusation in the Asian Context and Culture Post-COVID-19. Welcome to our parallel session with me, Gunawan Tambun Saribu. I'm from English um, Study Program. Faculty of Letters and Languages in Universitas Christian Indonesia as your moderator in this session. Before we start our presentation, let me read some rules during IEJ, Uki SLA Research International Conference. General rules. There are two general rules here. The first rule is the committee will provide an e-certificate for those who have failed in the attendance list for three days. So you have to complete Three day presence for our uh, for this uh, conference. Oh. Second rule is the committee will share the attendance links for each day according to the direction of the committee. You will have it uh, later on on your uh, chat bar. For presenter, for all the presenters that I have here, seven presenters. Uh, First, the presenter is obliged to follow the breakout rooms according to the direction of committee. It is not allowed to change rooms. And the second one, a moderator in charge will lead the parallel session. Third, presentation of the material is made in the form of PowerPoints. So make sure that your uh, presentation uh, set uh, in PowerPoint slide. The fourth, the material is delivered within 15 until 20 minutes. So prepare yourself to present your material uh, within 15 until 20 minutes, not more than that, because we have uh, a, li a limit time for both live and recorded, uh, recorded video. Fifth, for live mode presentation, presenters must uh, present online in parallel session and actively answer the questions from the audience. So I want to ask uh, uh, Ms. Who just now talked to me? Uh, Ms. Luis Loria Soarty, if uh, she uh, still, uh, he is still in an un unwell uh, condition, she may make a video uh, for her presentation for today. 
Yeah, you may uh, confirm her after this. All right. And the sixth for recorded video mode presentation, presenters are allowed not to be present in the Zoom room, but have to be ready to answer all the audience's question through emails. The seventh, the presenter is allowed to have a brief self-introduction at the time of delivering the material. So I invite you all, uh, Bapak Ibu, before you present your material, you may introduce yourself to all of us. And the last, for the presenter's rule, the presenter is allowed to ask our presenters in parallel session guided by the moderator. And for participants, it is not permissible to choose the scope of interest according to the available room during the parallel session. And the second, during the parallel session, participants are not allowed to change rooms. And the third, it is allowed to ask questions and discuss during parallel sessions with approval and the guidance from the moderator. And the fourth, participants can ask questions in person or via chat room. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to take uh, to uh, start our uh, parallel session. So first of all, I want to invite the first name that I see on my list. I want to invite our distinguishable uh, speaker. She is Amelia's German. And for Amelia's German, time is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Gunawan. Allow us to share our screen here. My pleasure. I can see it now. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> okay, my name is Emily Sherman. Mr. Yogi Saputra Mahmoud and Tai from President University are going to present students' perception, time preference, and corrective feedback in online writing classes. So our today's presentation have been divided into five parts. So first, we're gonna start with the introduction uh, and then literature review, after that, research methodology, finance discussion and conclusion. So uh, without further ado, let's start with the first uh, part of our presentation introduction, which is gonna be presented by uh, Mr. Yogi Saputra Mahabo. Okay, uh, thank you so much for Mr. Emilius German. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Yogi Saputra Mahmoud. I'd like to discuss the introduction, especially the ramifications in teaching and learning activities due to COVID-19. Next, please. Yeah, um, as we know that COVID-19 has impacted the teaching and learning activities throughout the world. In particular, in Indonesia, the Ministry of Education implemented online learning uh, starting from mid of March, 2020. And this leads to major ramifications in teaching and learning, especially from the shift uh, from face-to-face -face learning to online learning. And uh, some empirical studies or some recent studies highlight the challenges faced by university students in terms of the technical difficulties, for example, internet connection and then techni uh, limited technological literacy uh, possessed by the teachers as well as the students. And then another challenge includes the limited interaction and then supervision between lecturers and then the students. At the same time, however, uh, some courses actually require intensive direction and interaction, such as academic writing. As we all know that in academic writing, it requires uh, direction and then communication between students and uh, lecturers as well. Next, please. Yeah, therefore, uh, we actually, propose a research in terms of the corrective feedback and then uh, the online corrective feedback practice in English language teaching. Uh, when it comes to corrective feedback practice, uh, there are competing debates on that issue. Uh, one of the most prominent researchers uh, named Truscott <laughs> challenged the role of corrective feedback for several reasons. First of all, grammar, grammar correction is uh, contradictory to SLA theories. And then he also argued that grammar correction is time consuming for teachers and students. However, another prominent researcher also challenged Truscott's argument uh, in which uh, Ferris discussed that selective 
prioritize and clear error correction can actually help develop students' writing skills. And these are also supported by several empirical studies, as you can see uh, in the slide. And when it comes to researching corrective feedback in writing, Evans uh, discussed three contextual variables, one of which includes uh, learner variables, and this becomes our focus. So learner variables are defined as the importance of exploring how students can take advantages of corrective feedback practice in auto writing by identifying the types of aspects that should be corrected, including the practices as well as the frequency of corrective feedback. Uh, in terms of the areas of study on corrective feedback, there are actually two, two primary areas of studies. The first focus includes the discussion whether corrective feedback provides significant improvement or not for students' writing. And then another one focuses on more qualitative approach. For example, like it relates to the exploration of uh, teachers and learners' perceptions and then expectations and preferences on corrective feedback. So our study basically focuses on the second uh, area uh, in which we are going to investigate uh, or we were uh, investigating the perceptions or preferences of university students with regard to corrective feedback in an online learning environment. And this is guided by the following research question. Uh, yeah, what are the students' perceptions and preferences on corrective feedback in online writing classes? So the next will be about research methodology that will be delivered by Mr. Emilius German. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Yogi Saputra Mahmoud. So to reach the objective of this uh, study, uh, mixed method qualitative and quantitative was used uh, to, uh, uh, to to reach the objective. Uh, so 273 university students from 12 different study programs taking an English class amidst COVID-19 pandemic participated in this study. Uh, they were uh, assigned to write essays and reports and got feedback from the instructor via eCampus, Google Meet, Google Docs, Zoom, email, and WhatsApp group. And uh, survey research is sent using questions that they from late 2008 uh, was used to uh, collect the data. And the questionnaire consists of open-ended and closed-ended questions. And the questionnaire was uh, delivered or sent to the participants to Google, pla uh, Google Form platform. And uh, quantitative data uh, generated from the uh, closed-ended questions were analyzed, uh, was analyzed using uh, Pivot, uh, one feature in the uh, microspectral. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, qualitative data generated from the open-ended questions was analyzed using uh, NVivo uh, software. So uh, from, the, <clears throat> from the analysis, we found out that uh, the first student's perceptions of online writing class so uh, as you can see from this chart that more than 75% of the students perceive that writing class conducted online due to COVID-19 is considered important in improving their writing skills. And this finding uh, is supported by the previous study. The first one is from Sharma 2019, that students had a positive attitude toward using social media to support their yeah, learning. And another one is uh, what I said by Ahmed 2020, they state that most students had favorable views of Google Docs for collaborative writing and using Google Docs improved writing quality. And the second uh, findings is uh, about type of, write, uh, type of errors. So uh, as you can see from this uh, chart that most of the participants prefer their teachers to correct grammatical errors in their uh, essay or reports. So it's almost 20%, okay, only errors. And this is actually supported by prior studies that show students' positive attitudes and preference towards grammar correction uh, by Chan 2015 and Shaw 1996. Another major uh, peripheral type of errors uh, are uh, these, uh, like you can see here, the combination uh, between grammar and organization, and the next is grammar, vocabulary, and uh, organization, grammar and vocabulary, and finally, uh, grammar, vocabulary, organization, spelling, and punctuation. And uh, 
and we would like actually to uh, what's that to investigate investigate more. What is the reason behind this uh, preference? I mean, students' preference uh, regarding the type of errors to be corrected by the teachers. So uh, the first one regarding the uh, grammatical error. So we have three main reasons here. The first is lack of grammar knowledge, the importance of grammar in producing good essay. Uh, so they think that uh, was that it is important uh, was that to, to for grammar to be corrected. Uh, <coughs> And then finally, to improve their grammar. Yeah, uh, because they uh, are lack of grammar knowledge and they like to improve their grammar. So that's why they would like to have uh, what is that correction from their teachers. And the second one is grammar, combination between grammar and uh, organization. So it's uh, was it 11.8%. And we have three main reasons here. First is insufficient knowledge on the two elements and the importance of these elements in creating text and finally, teacher feedback focus. So here we can uh, was that know that teacher feedback focus in providing errors is also the reason for the students why they uh, prefer their uh, grammar, okay, why they prefer the grammar and conversation to be corrected by the by the teachers. And the third is uh, the combination between grammar, vocabulary, and organizations, which is 9.9%, almost 10%. And uh, we have three main reasons here. Uh, the first is the importance of these elements, and lack of knowledge on these elements. And uh, they think that these errors could lead to negative impact on readers. Maybe uh, why is that the, lead, the readers might have uh, oh, might misunderstood uh, what they have written. And the fifth is the combination between grammar and vocabulary, which is 9.2%. So, and the reasons are like we can see here, the lack of grammar and vocabulary knowledge and the importance of these two elements. And uh, here is actually the example uh, of what they uh, wrote actually in the uh, questionnaire. And the last is actually the combination of those aspects, of all aspects actually in uh, what is that, in the error corrections. Uh, which are grammar, vocabulary, organization, spelling, and punctuation. And they have three reasons here. Uh, and they are considered important and basic aspects to improve skills in writing and uh, lack of knowledge on those elements. And uh, last is teacher's feedback uh, focus. And uh, this is one of actually uh, the comments from the students of, of these corrections are totally important to improve our essay in the future. Yeah, let's move to this, uh, the second or uh, the third uh, findings here uh, regarding the student's preference on methods of indicating errors. So as you can see from this chart that uh, <clears throat> locating uh, the error uh, by underlying it and uh, also uh, indicating the types of error is the most uh, preferable uh, method of indicating errors for students. And then uh, it is followed by uh, the sixth uh, one, which is correcting the errors and then providing an explanation for the, uh, the error correction. And then the, the third is uh, underlining the error and then directing uh, the students to the source of information. So based on this uh, finding actually, uh, for the first one, uh, so far, we haven't uh, got okay. We haven't got any uh, previous studies uh, which found uh, about this one. So that's why this might be uh, adding uh, new uh, knowledge to this uh, this field actually. Uh, but the second one, which is uh, <clears throat> okay, which is uh, number six, the method number six, correcting the error and then providing an explanation for the error is supported by the previous study by Ganabati uh, in 2020 that 57.6 uh, of uh, the students agreed that teachers should locate the correct uh, errors. Mm -hmm. However, uh, this kind of findings uh, is actually has a negative uh, impact. Why? Because students tend to be passive if the teachers provide them uh, was that the, the, the correction for the errors. So they will not think like, okay, why uh, was it, why it is wrong or why it is correct, it's like that. 
So that's actually the third uh, findings. And now let's move on to the fourth findings uh, that students perceptions to, uh, which is students perception toward teachers feedback. Okay, uh, interestingly, uh, just like you can see from this chart that almost uh, one hundred percent or almost all the participants show positive response to the teachers feedback. Yeah, even though 20, uh, 27 27.2% of them uh, say that uh, they will they will read them but correct only the major errors. But it belongs to uh, was that uh, I mean the, they can be categorized as the one uh, who so positive uh, was that positive uh, feedback on teachers feedback, and this is actually supported by the two previous sources uh, from list Yannick. 2021 that 49 uh, student participants or 64.47% uh, had a good or positive perception toward teachers' uh, feedback in their RP class. And uh, like you can see here, it is even more than that, uh, which, is, which is 89% uh, uh, of the uh, participants uh, shows the positive uh, attitude toward teachers feedback. Okay, now let's come to the fifth findings, uh, which is students perception on teachers comments. Okay, so regarding this, uh, comments on organization and grammar are the most important comments uh, at 85%. And this is supported by uh, <clears throat> the previous study by Chen uh, and friends that students have a strong preference on extended comments on both content and grammar of their written work. And uh, the last, uh, which is related, related to kind of feedback students prefer their teacher to write in the future. So the combination of written comments in English and error corrections and grades are the most preferable feedback in the future at 62.5%. Yeah, uh, so those actually are the findings of uh, and a little bit of discussion on this uh, study. And now let's proceed to uh, the next part, which is uh, conclusions, uh, which is uh, delivered by uh, Mr. Yogi Saputra Mahmoud. Okay, uh, thank you. So, can you please next, next to to the next slide? Okay. So, yeah, as we know that uh, there are actually main points of the findings. The first one is that uh, students express their favorable preference toward grammatical revision from the lecturers in the online corrective feedback practice, and then the students also so preferred lecturers to locate the errors and then indicate uh, the types of errors. And when it comes to the, their perception, uh, students generally showed a positive attitude towards the lecturer's feedback. And um, lecturer's comments on organization and grammar were actually found to be the most mm -hmm. important for the students during the online corrective feedback practice. And in the future, students also express uh, that they preferred having comments in English and then error corrections and grades from the lecturers. And these findings uh, lead to several implications for future research and practice. So in terms of the future practice, so since the student's preference towards online corrective feedback has been identified in the current research, so it can inform the lecturers or the future lecturers about the, their practice of corrective feedback that can be positively responded by the students. Uh, meanwhile, for the future research, um, there are actually two implications that we can uh, propose here. So uh, studies on teachers' perception and preference on online corrective feedback practice uh, are necessarily, uh, should be conducted, actually. So we have conducted the students' perception and preference on corrective feedback, and it's better for us to add uh, the, the horizon of knowledge by identifying the teacher's perception and preference as well on corrective feedback practice. And also uh, we encourage future researchers to conduct the relationship between online corrective feedback practice during this COVID-19 or remote uh, teaching, and then the online writing performance made by the university students. Yeah, I think that concludes our conversation. Thank you so much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. And these are our references that we use. Please, if you have any questions uh, or any other inquiries, you can also contact us through this email. Other than that, uh, we invite questions from you all. Thank you so much.
Yeah, I do thank you for uh, Mr. Amelius and Mr. Yogi. And thank you so much for your interesting topic that you have delivered just now. So I want to invite to all presenters and participants in this room. If you have any question, please open your camera and directly ask your question. Or you can deliver your question by writing your questions on the chat bar. I will deliver your question later on to the both presenters. Please. You have, uh, I give you uh, seven minutes or uh, up to 10 minutes to all pre presenters and participants in this room. Can, can I ask a question, please? All right, uh, please. Okay, good. Uh, this is an interesting topic actually that I also work a lot in my university. Yeah, actually about uh, corrective feedback. And again, uh, the, the uh, discussions actually that's related to the students' writing, right? So that's part of the mm -hmm. productive skills that the students come up with. Uh, if I refer to the theory from Paul Nations related to the four strands of language learning, so in order to come up with the, I, I try to put that the, the fourth one is actually productive, yeah? So uh, the first one is meaningful input competence. Yeah, so something that anything that they hear, anything that they watch also, then something that they read, it's just all part of the meaningful input competence. The expectations is actually later on is the meaningful output competence, which is re, uh, related to the writing and also speaking. So in the middle, there is what's called by deliberate learning and also fluency development. Now, this is very interesting. I mean, that with the corrective feedback, before we go, for example, with the teacher feedback, do you provide any rooms, for example, for the students to work with their uh, peer corrective feedback? Again, then, in order to provide enough exposure and enough opportunity for them to kind of like a have a look and then think about that, and that's part of the deliberate learning. So then they are able to produce a better one before it comes to the teacher's feedback. And then probably before that, yeah, is there also any opportunity for them to kind of like example, read uh, some articles or informations before they start writing? Because again, then uh, meaningful input competence will strongly influence what they will write or what they, uh, what you call it, produce later on. That's my question. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Pa Iwayan Eka Budiarta, for your question. And now, uh, please, um, Sir Amelius or Mr. Yogi to answer his question. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Amelius, I think he experienced a trouble. So I think I would like to answer your question. That's a very interesting question, uh, Mr. Wayan Eka. Um, so uh, when it comes to the, you know, the meaningful input. So basically this research uh, is situated in English three subjects. So in English three subject, uh, it focuses on academic writing, sir. So before that students actually have English one and English two. So English one is actually when the students had the meaningful input itself. So because we focus on listening and reading as well. Uh, while English two, they actually try to start okay, having the writing experience as well as the, you know, like extensive reading as well. And English 3, it's actually like the uh, writing itself in which that they are assumed to have the, uh, the ability, uh, you know, like receptive skills first before the productive skills. And when it comes to the peer feedback, so that's actually a very good question. So uh, before the teacher feedback as well, so they actually have like peer feedback. So they will be group or they will work like with their peer. So they will have like multiple feedback, not only from the teachers, but also from their peer. But, you know, due to the limitation of our study, so we basically focus on uh, their perception towards the teacher's feedback. So uh, probably it can become our future paper uh, in terms of the practice of peer feedback as well in this remote teaching. So I think that's my answer to you. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. I'll try it. Thank you so much, Pa Iwayan Aikabudiato, for your question. And I invite uh, another question, other questions from the floor. 
please. I think okay. there is a question. There is a the question in the chat room, sir. In the chat room, yeah. <clears throat> maybe if uh, Emilius want to yeah. answer this. Yeah. Uh, okay. Or maybe directly uh, to you, not to the participants, please. Oh, it's for everyone, sir. Uh, but uh, let me try to answer. Uh, so thank you, Bu Norti Rahayu, for, uh, You're welcome. As yeah, for asking. Uh, so basically, just like uh, it is mentioned earlier, that uh, the students uh, that are uh, scheduled to have English 1, English 2, and English 3 in our uh, university. And then, so when it comes to the uh, writing uh, class, so they took it uh, in the same time. And it was in their uh, eighth uh, eight semester or yeah, eight uh, semester. Uh, and all of the students in one batch, 2000 and, uh, 2018 batch, uh, took that classes. So at the same time, we uh, schedule, uh, what is that? We schedule or organize the curriculum for uh, this class. And, uh, and also at the same time, we uh, collected the data. So that's actually how we collected the data. Uh, at the time, at the time they took English three, uh, which is academic writing, and what kind of writing was? Well, yeah, just like it is mentioned, uh, uh, reports and essay were assigned. So basically, it's like the, the 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 teachers actually are encouraged or are scheduled to have like uh, what is that uh, uh, type of assignment, reports mm -hmm. and essay. And also, uh, they are scheduled also to provide feedback uh, to provide feedback for their uh, students' output, which is here uh, writing. Yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, Thank you, Pak. So it means that uh, you really have to collaborate with the classroom teachers to organize the yeah, exactly. data collection. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly right. So, uh, in collecting the data, so when it, when it uh, was that it was a bit difficult for us to collect the data, so we just contacted the uh, the teachers in the class to help us collect the data. That's what we did, uh, Mrs. Tirahayu. Yes, thank yeah. you, sir. No thank problem. you so much. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm very sorry, Bu Nurtirahayu. I missed your question. You That's okay, Pak. All right, thank you so much uh, for uh, this active uh, uh, parallel session for, for the first uh, session. Thank you so much, Pa Emilius and Pa Yogi Saputra. And would yeah. you please right. upload your uh, PPT on the link? Yeah, oh, thank okay. you so much. Yeah. And now we go on to the second presenters. And I have an updated list here. So it, it is written here. There are two uh, speakers, uh, two uh, authors. And the first uh, author is Sho Kobayashi. And the second author is Yuya Naga Nakagawa. And I invite you, one of you, to present your presentation for, for both of you. OK, let me start. Uh, could you please stop the share of the slide oh. for the presenter? By Yogi, by Emilius. Okay. Yes, already. Yep. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you very much. And now I'm going to change my slide. Oh, okay, how about right now? Could you everybody yeah. see my slide? We can yeah. see it now. Please All, right. All right, thank you. So let me start my presentation, our presentation first. Um, before we start that, let me introduce myself first and Yuya Nakagawa is going to present himself next. And my name is Sho Kobayashi and I'm special appointed associate professor in the Faculty of Education at Osaka Kyoku University. And I'm currently engaged in teacher training at the university and my research interests are in computer mediated communication and willingness to communicate and international posture in English language education. And next presenter, Yuya Nakagawa, could you please explain? My name is Yuya Nakagawa, the co-presenter of this research and uh, from the Mie University, Japan. Hello all, thank you very much for coming to our session. Okay, thank you very much. 
And now, can I start the next slide? And in first introduction, the Japan Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology has proposed the development of an English teaching system with a small number of students and the enhancement of the opportunity to come in contact with the English language. And in an English as a foreign language EFL environment, such as Japan, there are a few chances for learners to regularly speak in English or for teachers to give each student sufficient corrective oral feedback and ICT device and networks can improve such situations and provide opportunities to speak in English. And there are the, some examples of the literature review that related to the ICT devices. And next is the literature review about willingness to communicate. And these are the uh, five main literature review that related to today's my research presentations and and from these literature reviews, I found out and in a threat-free environment, such as using ICT devices, one face-to-face, -face, not face-to-face -face environment, but by through using the computers, we learners do not have to perform in front of their other classmates. They feel relaxed and maybe it leads to reduce their anxieties. And my expectation is like this. Um, students need to experience success in improvised speaking in situations where there's little anxiety, which is expected will consequently lead to confidence in speaking spontaneously. Thus, it can be expected that learning through video calls will help students reduce, reduce student unwillingness to speak English and improve their self-confidence even for beginner learners with low English proficiency. However, little research has focused on the psychological changes in beginner learners with low English proficiency who have experienced video calls and actual conversational interactions. The present study is one-to-one -one video calls and lasted 25 minutes and used the free Skype softwares. And this type of call has six characteristic points. One, the opportunity to practice improvised interaction in a state very close to face-to-face -face environment. Second, the learner has the opportunity to speak in the spare time regardless of the place of study or time. And third, the calls are one-to-one. -one. And fourth, the teacher's feedback cannot be understood by listening. Words can be written and referenced in the chat box which serves as a scaffolding. And the first learners can review vocabulary in the chat box. And after the lesson, the students can write and summarize the content that was discussed in the video. And video calls can provide solutions for a shortage of interactive language activities, as well as class size problems. And through negotiations of meaning and the accumulation of success experiences, may reduce unwillingness to communicate. And here are the four research questions that related to using a video. So watch it carefully. And the subject of the today's research is, this research comprised a case study of one female student who did not major in English, studied at a national university and had low English proficiency. And the instructor, a different instructor was designated for every video call session. Due to time differences with Japan, the author hired female Filipino instructors in their twenties with more than three years experience teaching beginners and ensure the conversation was conducted under the same circumstances by specifying their content procedures and time allocation and communicating this to instructors in advance. And teaching design is here. The participant attended the author's research laboratory twice a week for the 25 minute video calls in a total of eight sessions in one month. They also used a tablet device position in such a way that the face was visible to confirm that the video call instructor was following the procedure. And the lesson was conducted without headphones so that both the participant and the instructor's voice could be heard. The teaching materials like this, the picture description, 
And these were provided by the DMM, the companies, and were chosen due to their picture description, which are arranged in sequences that are similar to the format used in the pre, post, and delayed speaking test. And they also include material that allow for question and answer interactions in English using pictures and themes. And there are many types of materials allowing the use of a different one for each of the eight video calls. This is the procedure of the video call. So there are the five steps and warm up and home study after the steps. In analysis, to measure the effects of the practice from multiple angles and increase the student reliability, they also collected five data items and used quantitative and qualitative analysis methods. Collected and analyzed data from the speaking test, questionnaires, field notes, recorded videos, and semi-structured interviews. As for the speaking tests, a total of three tests were conducted, one in November before the practice and one in December after the practice and another two months later in February to investigate to what extent the change was maintained. The speaking tests were conducted face-to-face -face between the author and the participant. To measure speaking ability, they also obtained authorization to use sample questions from the AKM Foundation of Japan level to practice English proficiency test. And the ENO and the Abitas indicated the fluency, complexity, and accuracy were adopted as measurement items. Fluency was measured with the following criteria, A through E. Let's take a look at the holistic evaluation, the table two. Two evaluators comprehensively assessed fillers, pauses, repetitions, including modifications and utterance rates in five levels. And complexity was measured with two criteria, A, the number of sections, and B, the number of words per sentence, which was obtained by dividing the total number of words by the number of sentence. Accuracy was measured with two criteria, and the reliability of the evaluation, kappa coefficient was calculated, and the K equal one was confirmed which means the both uh, research evaluation was the same. And the question is, you saw that questionnaire on unwillingness to speak English was implemented and measured with a seven point scale method in the pre and post surveys. The, and adopted three items related to low perceived competence to speak English, three items indicating a high level of anxiety about speaking English, and three items showing tendencies to avoid speaking English and analyze the average of each result. Same structure interviews. Immediately after every video call and conducted a one-to-one -one interview of about 50 minutes. The interview was semi-structured to ensure that the participant discussed what was relevant to the research purpose and was recorded with the participant consent. And the following questions were asked to investigate changes in the participant's consciousness. And same, among the descriptions in this data extracted the parts related to consciousness, awareness, and anxiety about speaking. And the field note is about the aspects such as the date of each video call, meaning negotiation and feedback from instructors. And the video recordings and voice data from the conversations. And I transcribed all the utterances and examined what kind of interaction and learning occurred. Immediately after each interview, a stimulated recall method of watching the recorded video call was employed for about 30 minutes. And the participant was asked about her state of mind. And here is the results. First, about the speaking test. Compared to the pre test, a significant growth in fluency was observed in the post test in terms of the number of description points, the number of uttered words, WPM, and the holistic evaluation indicators. And this is about the complexity. 
Only a few short English sentences were at all in the protest. However, the use of while, so, and but increased in the post test and the linguistic progression could be observed in the structure of other sentences. All indicators showed an increase in accuracy in the post test. Analysis of the pre and post test results show that the past tense was used more appropriately and accurately in the post test. The results of delayed test highlighted that WPM, the holistic evaluation of fluency, were improved compared to the post-test, and it was observed that the participant was speaking at appropriate speed. Although complexity and accuracy decreased slightly, there was not much change after the post-test, and it was found that these aspects were maintained to some extent. Next question is, after the instruction, all indicators of perceived competence, anxiety, and avoidance were significantly reduced. These results suggest that improvisational video calls may be effective in reducing unwillingness to speak English in beginner learners who have low English proficiency. To complement the results of the speaking test and questionnaire and determine how the participant felt during the video calls, Codes related to consciousness, anxiety, and noticing were assigned to the description in the verbatim transcription of the same structured interviews. Figure two shows summarize the analysis worksheet on the awareness transformation process and the relationships between several categories of superordinate concepts. Um, initially, the participant was unsettled because she noticed a gap in her English ability. However, as the number of video calls increased, opportunities for the hypothesis testing were created and the instructor feedback promoted understanding and built self-confidence. Anxiety was produced by learner related factors such as not being able to say what she wanted or being silent as well as teacher factors such as the teacher's weak reaction and only giving oral feedback, which led to the participant not being able to understand. Becoming used to repeat communication, short and corrective feedback, slow speech, a friendly atmosphere, and chat box text reduced this anxiety. Experiencing growth in one's ability and gradually increasing one's English expressions result in increased confidence and the state in which one can ask questions and solve problems. The, relations, uh, the relationship of each generated code was examined. Common codes were correlated and categories were created. Under each category, subcategories were set as subordinate concepts. And finally, the categories shown in figure four were generated. The participant noticed her transformation throughout the video call experience. When trying to speak spontaneously in the first video call, she understood that she had underestimated her English proficiency and realized the possibility of communicating in English Repeated video calls offered opportunities for calculating comprehensible output and hypothesis verification. And when she realized that she had problems with vocabulary and output, she was motivated to overcome them. In the latter sessions, negotiations of meaning were frequent, which promoted an understanding of meaning, increased confidence. Interruption, please. It's a show. Yes. You have five minutes. Yes, okay. Yeah, five I know. Minutes. And a sense of accomplishment. And these are the field notes and video recordings. The analysis of the stimulated recall revealed which corrective feedback resulted in learning, what triggered anxiety, relaxation, and how the participant became able to make requests of the instructors. Except <laughs> one to three revealed changes in the participant attitudes. In the first video call, she could not say what she did not understand. Even if she wanted to ask a question, she could not tell the instructor. By the first video call, excerpt two, she could say the words she could not understand in turn two, and in turn two of excerpt three could make a request for clarification. Consequently, input correction, which, aff which affects second language acquisition, occurred in turn three. 
um, an attitude of vol voluntary trying to have a conversation was observed and there was a change to a positive attitude towards speaking. The participant described her feeling as followed. That the repeated video calls alleviate anxiety, changed the participant attitude to active talking and gave her the confidence to ask when she had a question. In the fifth video call, except four, the participant asked the instructor to repeat a question that she did not understand in turn two. In the seventh video call, except six, she negotiated the meaning with the instructor because in turn one, she could not say the English expression show to describe something appearing on television. Furthermore, in except eight, she was able to stop the conversation and ask a question in turn two. Compared to the first video call except one, she was able to request qualifications and there was a clear change in attitudes. This change occurred not only in response to the instructor's question, but also in the participant herself controlling the conversation and trying to proceed with a video call in a way that suited her. That participant described her feeling as followed. And by becoming able to use fillers, the conversation progressed and the understanding of meaning was accelerated. That since the participant could now use a filler that she could not say before, she felt her own transformation and the sense of accomplishment. In this case study, they also recorded and verified a participant's speaking ability before and after a series of video calls and the psychological change in these exchanges. Conclusion, the instructor's feedback promoted the participant utterances and understanding led to output through negotiation of meaning and influence confidence in interactions. Noticed, noticing the gaps in her English ability, short oral corrective feedback and input modification in the form of chat box text promoted meaning comprehension and consequently were highly effective in reducing anxiety. It was shown that to improve speaking ability, reduce anxiety, and increase WTC, the following are required. Real life experience, becoming accustomed to speaking in English spontaneously through video calls, even if it is only a few sessions for a short period. Successful experiences of communicating in English with foreigners using instructor feedback and utterance examples as a scaffolding and being able to sense one's growth. And the last one is the limitations. This study targeted one learner with low English proficiency, meaning its results cannot be generalized. Moreover, the verification of speaking ability was measured only by picture description, which is another of this study's limitations. In future research, this study's conclusion should be confirmed by increasing the number of participants and targeting diverse learning groups. And this research was supported by the JSPS grant in aid for scientific research. Thank you for listening. All right. I didn't thank you, uh, Mr. Shio Kobayashi, uh, Kobayashi, and also for the second author, Yuya Nakagawa. Thank you so much for your interesting topic to, uh, that you have delivered to us. And uh, we'll invite you all, uh, the presenters and the participants here, to deliver your question if you have question. You can also uh, use the chat bar for delivering your question. Can can I ask questions? Yeah, please. I give you time, uh, Pa Wayan Eka. Yes. Okay. Konnichiwa, Kobayashi-san, Nakagawa-san, Eka Tomoshimasu. Uh, it's really ah. interesting. <laughs> I, uh, it's really interesting of your presentations. That's reminded me with what I have uh, done long time ago from 2007 until 2009 at Nansan University in Nagoya. So I was also involved with uh, what you call it, how to help the students actually to improve their speaking. And my research was about, is it possible to be fluent in English in non-English speaking country? And I was, uh, the idea is actually by having lunch together with the teachers, with the lecturers, and we tried to use English. And Aikang is also part of our 
topic later on because again then from that uh, community from that space actually and the students we uh, I propose a space to university to the university uh, to let for example the students to join in and also they try to focus on using English to get enough exposure to with, with their English and improve their speaking yeah mm -hmm. and uh, parts of that is a Kang was that a lot uh, we practice then how to come up with the pictures and how to explain that and the pattern that we did actually again I, 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 I try to follow a lot uh, what uh, Paul Nations mentions about teaching speaking there are four three two method so for example like four minutes yeah, they start yeah. talking, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then later on, three minutes. I'm sure that you're also familiar with that then, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, to what extent, actually, this activity that you also provide for the students, for the participants, actually, in order to improve their English or any other method that you have done, actually, for this case study? Yeah, to improve, the, to improve the fluency of the speaking ability, I also use this kind of method, 432, yes. And but today's my research topic is that related to using the technologies, and with the, um, not threatening the, or the unwillingness to speak English because there are no, uh, no audience around the participants. So even if one low e English efficiency learners, they feel um, relaxed and try to express her own experiences and her, try to express something in English. And sometimes she added Japanese, but you know, no, um, other students watching her. So she feel relaxed and try to do her best to improve her English ability. And thank you for your comments. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, actually. That's, that's uh, I mean, that uh, yeah. really interrelated with, yeah. with what I've done, yeah. actually. And thank you for explaining the Aikens <laughs> systems. Maybe most of the listeners, they don't know what the Aiken test is. And you yeah. are very familiar with the Japanese situations. <laughs> and thank you for explaining to add my presentations. Any yeah. other questions or any other um, comments? The Nakagawa sensei, do you want to add something? Uh, thank you very much for a very, you know, uh, insightful comment. And as you know, the Japanese people and the students uh, tend to, you know, hesitate making mistakes in front of their, you know, friends. So this is a one uh, strategy to beat the solution. Yeah, thank you very much for your comment. Thank you. Yes, and I also want to add, I spoke very fast to finish my presentation, um, but I tried to um, submit my research paper to the ASEAN UFA journal. So if accepted, all listeners can read my researches. So I hope um, it will be accepted. <laughs> yeah, we do hope so. Um, uh, Mr. Sho and Yuya, don't forget to upload your PPT slide. Thank okay. You. Yep. Any question? We still have five more minutes to the question answer session. No one. All right. So the, uh, to make uh, our time briefly, and so I invite. Uh, thank you so much for uh, Mr. Show and Yuya Nakagawa. Arigato gozaimasu. Arigato gozaimasu. And I want to invite the. Arigato gozaimasu. I want to invite, uh, yeah, I have here, there are three authors. The first author is Nurti Rahayu, and the second author is Professor Dr. Ha Didi Suherdi, um, Eddie, and the third author is Pupung Purna Warman, MSC, and a PhD. So they are title of the research is Students' Willingness to Communicate, Can Inform a Digital Learning of English How? So I invite one of you, uh, sir, Bapak Ibu, to present your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the time given to us. Can everybody see the slide now? Yes, it it yes. is seen clearly, please. Okay, thank you. So first of all, I would like to say uh, good morning, everyone. I'm good very morning. excited to be here. I have seen the great discussion among all of you. And I hope that I can also get valuable feedback from all of you to improve my uh, research. So as it has been mentioned by the moderators, the title is Students' Willingness to Communicate uh, Can Informal Digital Learning of English or Idola Help? 
So let me introduce our team. So uh, it's me, Norti. Uh, actually, I am a lecturer at Trisakti School of Reason, but right now I'm striving my degree at English Language Education in Universitas Pendidikan uh, Indonesia, Bandung. The second address is Mr. Didi Suherdi, and the third address is Mr. Pupung. Purna Warman, and this is our research outline. I hope I can cover it in the uh, 15 minutes time, yeah? So the first I would like to mention about a short introduction followed by literature review and then the methodology, finding discussion and last but not least will be conclusion. Now, let me share uh, my research introductions. As you know that nowadays people uh, suffering from the global COVID-19 pandemic. And at the same time, it has also created a new normal that further spring board opportunities to large scale implementation of online education. So with a greater chance for cross-cultural communication due to the rapid advancement of digital media and communication technology, also the application of online learning. So recent studies have shed new light on the relationship between second language willingness to communicate yeah, previous authors have discussed about unwillingness to communicate. Now it's time to discuss about willingness to communicate and technology enhanced learning. So informal digital learning of English or IDLE shows strong potential to address some uh, limitation, classroom limitations and the promotion of second language development. So in this perspective, uh, I see that very few research investigated the relationship between idols and uh, second language willingness to communicate in the class, outside the class and digital setting, especially in Indonesian context. Most of the research are found in uh, our neighboring uh, countries, for example, Taiwan or Korea and other countries. Now we would like to find out about the relationship between idols and the willingness to communicate in Indonesia. And uh, we have three research questions to guide us to finish the study. The first one is, to what extent is the student's idle? And then the second is to what extent is the second language willingness to communicate in three different contexts. The first one is inside the classroom, outside the classrooms, and also digital settings. And the third question is what is the relationship between idols and uh, willingness to communicate inside the class, outside the class, and uh, digital setting? So uh, we uh, utilize uh, some theories for our literature review. The first one will be second language willingness to communicate and then informal digital learning of English. Yeah, so in IDLE, uh, we utilize a framework, analytical framework by Light et al. It uh, divides the, the IDLEs into two, uh, two. The first one, informed focus, and then second will be meaning focus, yeah. And then we also provide uh, some glance descriptions about online teaching during pandemic, especially about advantages and disadvantages. Okay, having finished with the lecture review, we have some methodology. So the design is correlational with survey. So we utilize quantitative data, of course. The data analysis is conducted by a descriptive statistic correlation and hierarchical or sequential regression. Some people might be familiar with uh, sequential regressions using SPSS. And then the participants were college students from several institutions in Jakarta and surrounding area. We prefer Jabodetabek. And uh, as many as 205 uh, students fill in the online questionnaire uh, to disagree to the research participants, so they were removed from the data. So the total participant is 203. The data collection is conducted by distributing online questionnaire uh, through a WhatsApp group for lecturers uh, located in Jabodetabek area. It was conducted uh, for about two months, yeah. And then beside this one, uh, we also have some library research and uh, questionnaire distribution is by utilizing convenient sampling. Now, this is the instrumentation. First, we utilize demographic data. It consists of age, gender, international experience, course experience, and uh, adapted from Lee and Silvan. Uh, and then the second will be idle, uh, frequency idle, 
we ask question about how frequent the students are using uh, or uh, utilizing idols and their daily activities, and then form focus idol with five items, meaning focus idol with six items. Uh, we have five Likert or Likert scale, one stand for nevers and uh, five stand for always. And second language willingness to communicate, it consists of uh, digital or online willingness to communicate for items inside the class, willingness to communicate for items, outside the class, willingness to communicate item for items. We utilize four Likert scale from strongly unwilling with one and strongly willing with four, adapted from Lee and Lee and Lee and Jajati. So before we proceed for other analysis, we have conducted uh, uh, some validity tests and also reliability tests. Uh, the result of reliability, all the instruments show high reliability with Cronba Alpha above eight, uh, 0 0.8. And then the validity is done by conducting the uh, R count and R, R count and R, ta R tables and the result, all the items, uh, all the R count for all items are above the R table. So it means that all items are valid and no item is dropped. So uh, this is a step of doing hierarchical regression. First, uh, we select the dependent variables. So as you know that I uh, willingness to communicate are uh, in three different contexts. So we have three dependent variables. The first one is digital uh, willingness to communicate. Second will be outside classroom and the third will be inside the classroom. So I put three dependent variables. And then uh, for independent variables, uh, we uh, set, uh, we input a set of variables, yeah. So uh, it comes in four different blocks or model. The first block is demographic data. The second block, we entered English experience and English uh, level. And then for, and then for uh, the second block, English experience and English level entered. And then the third block will be idle rations. Uh, form focus idols and meaning focus idols and uh, the fourth blocks come from uh, one other the other the other types of WTC. For example, if uh, the dependent variables digital willingness to communicate, then the other two will be input as independent variables to see the how uh, other types of uh, willingness to communicate loads to each other. So this is the result. First, we uh, have the data of demographic. So it comes with gender, age, program, institutions, levels, and English course experience. So uh, you, you can see that most of the participants are, are female. And then the age uh, start from 18 until 25. And we classify the program from English departments and non-English departments. And then institution can be state and private. Mostly uh, the participants are from private universities and the levels come from different levels of course. And uh, I also ask a question whether they have uh, English course experience and almost the same uh, participant responded uh, with yes and no. Now this is the result for uh, the first research question, to what extent is idle? So I utilize the mean analysis to provide the class descriptions about students idle. The result uh, show that doing tasks through apps and listen to English songs appear to be the most frequent activities with uh, mean average uh, 4.23 and uh, the lowest one, uh, no, uh, in a meaning focus we have 3.19. So chat in social media is the lowest mean score. So, uh, they show that students are not very convenient to have a chat in social media in English. Yeah, some students even say that using English in the social media chat uh, is that like showing that uh, uh, he or he's boasting about his ability and so on. So there are some stereotype of using uh, English in social media that uh, makes students unwilling to use it. In general, the all activities are conducted every day because uh, mostly the average is from every day until uh, many times every day. So I think the descriptive statistics shows uh, uh, that that's 
uh, students are familiar with all the activities and they, they do all the activities for every day to support their learning or sometimes they just do it for fun. How about willingness to communicate? Okay, we see here, if we just come with the remarks, all the components from the uh, online WTC and then our class WTC and in class WTC mostly, uh, the response will be maybe willing, so still in the middle. They're not quite very confident to say, yes, I'm strongly willing to communicate, but say, yes, maybe yes or maybe no. So. Uh, Students are requested to choose for like a skill showing willingness to conduct each activity and the mean score range from 2.20, 2.83 as the lowest one, showing that students may be willing to communicate in class and in class. So I see that if we look at the average mean score here, the highest one will be uh, 3.23. This is in a digital uh, or online setting and then followed by in a classroom 3.15 and then the last one will be outside the class 3.07. But in general, the participants say that they may be willing to communicate in English. Now, how about a research question? Correlation among variables here. So as uh, we have discussed before that we have uh, several instruments from demographic and uh, uh, idols and also the WTC here. So it shows uh, that uh, willingness to communicate in digital setting uh, positively correlate with idle durations and then form focus idols and also meaning focus idols. It happens also with uh, willingness to communicate outside the classroom. It, it, it has a, a positive significant uh, correlation with gender and then uh, idle durations, form focus and meaning focus. It happens also with willingness to communicate inside the classroom. It has a positive and significant correlation with uh, gender, form focus, meaning focus and other types of willingness to communicate. And this is uh, to answer the third research questions, uh, how about the digital willingness to communicate? As you know here that there are four blocks. Yeah, so uh, I have provided the model summary for hierarchical regression of digital willingness to communicate. So these are the four uh, blocks of the predictors of digital willingness to communicate. So the first block here, and then uh, the demographic, and then second, I enter uh, English experience, English level. And then in the third block, I enter uh, in, uh, idle durations, uh, for focus idols and meaning focus and so on. So we just focus on the R square and R square chains and also the significant uh, value here. Uh, the first model of block has an R square value of 0 0.022, which can be interpreted as institution program, gender, age, and class level, or demographic data score account for 2.2% of the variance in digital W. DC. However, the value is not significant. You see here that the significant F chain is more than uh, 0.05, means that uh, it says not the, the inverse is not significant. And then when English experience and English level are added, we come to second block. So the R square value of 0 0.180, meaning that the R square change is 0.1. 158, it means that the addition explain 18% of the total variance. So we see here in the second block, the R squared is 0 0.180. So it means that it, uh, this model provides or explain 18% of all the variance in digital WTC. And the change here is 15.8. So 15.8 is the contribution of the additional variables uh, in block two, which is class uh, English experience and English level. So uh, the and the third uh, three blocks, yeah, two and four, two until four. They have uh, they have they are statistically significant because the F is less than zero point zero zero one. So model three, model three or block three account for twenty nine point eight percent. While model two, yeah. Ma'am Nurti, you yeah. have five more minutes to present your. Thank you so much for the friendly reminder. I'll go on with the result then. 
the model four explains the total variance of 48.7. So it means that the, all of the variables here contribute to 48% of uh, the factors affecting digital willingness uh, to communicate. Now, how about uh, hierarchical regression of class WTC here? So as you know, first I come with R square here. This is the contributions of mod, uh, block uh, model one. So it contributes to 8.3% uh, significant. And then the second is 16. We know that the second predictors, English experience and English level has a significant, quite high contributions of uh, outside the class willingness to communicate. And then the, the model three, idle one and two is much higher with 19.9. .9. And the total uh, variables here contribute to 61. 0.3% of the outside the class willingness to communicate and all of the variables here are proven to be significant. Last, we have model summary of hierarchical regression inside the class WTC. Yeah, this one uh, show that all of the variables are significant. As you know, first of all, the demographic data accounts for 10.7% of inside the class. And then the second block, contributes to 20 and 20.7% uh, 20 of inside the class WTC. And then the third block provide 28.6% uh, of in class in class WTC. And overall variables contribute to 63.9% of inside the class WTC. So uh, there is increasing contribution from uh, the digital WTC and then outside the class and inside the class. So this is the conclusion and recommendation. So this study uh, revealed daily use of idle for both form and meaning focus activities with mean 3.60. The participants show their possibility of willingness to communicate a digital outside and inside the classroom. And then the second conclusion is that the willingness to communicate and digital setting has significant positive correlation with idle duration form and meaning focus idle. Uh, willingness to communicate outside and inside classroom significantly associate with gender, form and meaning focus idle. Uh, three, demography, English experience and idle were significant predictors of students' uh, second language willingness to communicate inside and outside the classroom. Okay, uh, second language willingness to communicate in digital setting were explained by English experience and idle. All variables contribute to total variance of 48.7 percent for digital willingness to communicate, the lowest one, 61.3 percent for the outside the class willingness to communicate, and 63.9 percent uh, in classroom willingness to communicate. And this is the recommendation. Since the data is based from self-reported questionnaire, so participants might under or overestimate the responses. Thus, future studies should employ data triangulation by incorporating observation or interviews to validate, uh, to, to triangulate and to provide supplementary data for uh, the survey. And then add more variables that may affect or hinder second language willingness to communicate such as affected variables and other local characteristics. Last but not least, uh, more studies on instruments development of willingness to communicate because we see that each item can comprise only a limited uh, statement and uh, it opens for uh, other developments of these instruments. I think uh, this study uh, shed or uh, provide more uh, proof on the relationship between idols and the willingness to communicate. I know that it's far from perfect, but anyhow, we, we can, uh, based on the finding, we can encourage the teachers uh, to provide more attention on student, uh, students' uh, willingness to communicate and also at the same time, uh, booster students' uh, positive activities by conducting idle in their daily activities regarding the fact that the pandemic uh, make uh, the students study from home. I think uh, that it's all about my presentation. If there are some valuable, uh, if, if, if there is some valuable feedback, I'll be very happy. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much for your presentation, Nurti. It was a very interesting talk. And I would like to invite you all to deliver your question to uh, Mem Nurti.
as the presenter of this presentation for the search uh, chances. Uh, is there any question, please? I will see my chat bar. Betul, Bu Wenda. What does it mean? Uh, Martinus Lafu Salu. Do you have any question? Betul, Bu Wenda means what? It's ambiguous. Hello? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, please, if you have any question, please uh, deliver directly. Pak Martinus Lafu. Hello, hello. Yes, Pak. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, silakan Pak Martinus. You can deliver directly to Ma'am Nurti. Your question. Pak Martinus, can you hear me? I think Pak Martinus have troubles. Uh, oh yeah. And signal. Right he now. is he's and he's muted now. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Uh, maybe uh later on. Uh, okay. if there is someone deliver the question via chat bar, I will deliver to you by you. writing the question. Thank you so much, Ma'am Nurti Rahayu. You're so, welcome. Uh, we will go to the fourth. Chance. So just now we had heard that uh, Miss Dwi Solaria and her friends maybe will deliver their presentation uh, the last session. So uh, this chance I uh, will give to Dr. Christianus Iwa Iwayan Eka Budiartha, MA, Magisters of Arts. So uh, please, Dr. Christianus, uh, we give you time for presenting your topic. I think I, I have preparing a video, so that's actually the time will be not going to be very long then. I'll send oh, it I see. already to the... I see. Pa, uh, thank you for, for confirmation. Uh, yes. pa, pa Leo, pa Taat, pa Leo, Leo, okay. Uh, I will chat uh, privately to the host uh, later on. Uh, uh, pa Wayan, can we uh, give this session uh, to the next presenters? Maybe later on we will uh, if, display. I think I can also play that actually if you want, if you're not oh. ready there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I decide that, uh, please. Okay. Yeah. So if you allow me to share my screen, then I can, uh, what do you oh, call it? Share it. That's the big problem because um, I think possible. I think possible. But can you see my screen now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let me check uh, the sound now. also. Before that, can the pre presenters or the participant ask you directly after this video or via email? Sorry, Pak. How are you? Can you hear that? Yeah, just play it. We'll okay. see if it works or not. Hi everyone, how are you? My name is Christianus Iwayan Eka Budiata. Uh, today... Is that, can you hear that, Pa? Yes, we can. Okay, good, yes. I would like to present my paper with the title Investigating the Relationship Between EFL Academic Vocabulary and Students' English Language Competence Across Different cohorts. Here, before we start, I would like to share the outline of what I'm going to talk today. And I will give you some illustrations about the purpose of the study 
and then my research questions very quickly to drive you the literature review and then methodology and finally go over the major findings of the study. Okay, good. The issue of lexical competence in academic writing for higher education level covers several aspects. For example, we can see here Gilbert in 2010 and Kelly in 2010 underline that the difficulties of writing skills for university students caused by unclear vocabulary items that teachers and language instructors introduce to their students to support their academic writing competence. Some academic personnel who uh, participated in Rebe and Paul 1998 study observed that the difficulties also in forming morphological construction, orthographic uh, development, and word choice were rated as a serious and acceptable issue. Yes. Therefore, as a result, then, there is a growing body of academic texts, a growing research of academic texts academic writing and educational form. Knowing and using sufficient academic words uh, in academic writing is considered crucial for higher education students as it plays an important role for their academic success. However, there are some issues on what words should be introduced and how they should be used during the learning process. According to Cobb and Force in Bogus and Lauter 2004, at least there are three situations that could hinder the language learners from their effort to learn the less frequent words like academic words. Number one, many language learners, particularly at our students, they are identified scarcely possible to access large amount of English words during their life. And the second one, when most of academic works are available in text, the acquisitions of letter of the words to text exposure is sluggish and limited. The third one, language learners may learn English vocabulary in a context or through naturalistic acquisitions process, while most of the surrounding words are in context. Okay. Now, the frequency of lexical items also has become one of the criteria in selecting what vocabulary items should be introduced to the student. In comparison to the words that appear in the general service list or GSL, the academic words are lexical items with low frequency occurrence. Therefore, many institutions include the issue of academic vocabulary as part of their curriculum. And introduce the academic word list or AWL through their English for academic purposes. Ivanik in 1998 stated that a claim that higher education students could position themselves as a part of a particular intellectual process where they can use particular academic words in order to argue, to defend, to define, to evaluate and also generalized in academic writing. And the choice of employing academic words into the study of vocabulary profile is to be the crucial role of this group of vocabulary items in supporting the students along with their academic studies at the university level. Anyway, can you see the slides, my slides? I think it seems that my slides is not working over there. Pa uh, Gunawan? Your slide is about uh, the background still. Yeah, what, what happened with that then, yeah? Let's check that. <laughs> That's strange. Can you see that? Uh, can you refresh it or you? I don't know. I mean, that actually it's probably it's supposed from the the committee to play that. If is it, I play that from my own, then I cannot see that only the sounds then, right? It's not the slides. Yeah, only the sounds and only- uh, The your, background. <clears throat> your appearance. Sir, oh. I, I want to try to share screen. Yes. All right. Yeah, please, uh, the host will play the- uh, Okay. 
Good. Good. There was a trouble just now. Sorry, all. How are you? My name is Christianus Iwayan Eka Budiata. Uh, Uh, today, I would like to present my paper with the title Investigating the Relationship Between EFL Academic Vocabulary and Students' English Language Competence Across Different Cohorts. Here, before we start, I would like to share the outline of what I'm going to talk today. And I will give you some illustrations about the purpose of the study and then my research questions very quickly to drive you to the literature review, the methodology, and finally go over the major findings of the study. Okay, good. The issue of lexical competence in academic writing for higher education level covers several aspects. For example, we can see here Gilmore in 2010 and Kelly 2010 underline that the difficulties of writing skills for university students caused by unclear vocabulary items that teachers and language instructors introduce to their students to support their academic writing competence. Some academic personnel who uh, participated in Rebe et al. 1998 study observed that the difficulties also involving morphological construction, orthographic uh, development and word choice were rated as a serious and acceptable issue. This, therefore, as a result, then there is a growing body of academic texts, a growing research of academic texts, academic writing, and educational thought. Knowing and using sufficient academic words yeah, uh, in academic writing is considered crucial for higher education students as it plays an important role for their academic success. However, there are some issues on what words should be introduced and how they should be used during the learning process. According to Cobb and Horse in Bogers and Laufer 2004, at least there are three situations that could hinder the language learners from their effort to learn the less frequent words like academic words. Number one, Many language learners, particularly EFL students, they are identified scarcely possible to access large amount of English words during their life. And then the second one, while most of academic words are available in text, the acquisitions of, uh, of the words through text exposure is sluggish and indefinite. And the third one, language learners may learn English vocabulary in a context or through naturalistic acquisitions process, while most of the surrounding words are recognized. Okay, now the frequency of lexical items also has become one of the criteria in selecting what vocabulary items should be introduced to the students. In comparison to the words that appeared in the general surface list or GSL, then academic words are lexical items with low frequency occurrence. Therefore, many institutions include the issue of academic vocabulary as part of their curriculum and introduce the academic word list or AWL through their English for academic purposes. Ivanik in 1998 stated, that, uh, stated a claim that higher education students could position themselves as a part of a particular intellectual process where they can use particular academic words in order to argue, to defend, to define, to evaluate, and also generalize in academic writing. And the choice of employing academic words into the study of vocabulary profile is to date the crucial role of this group of vocabulary items in supporting the students along with their academic studies at university level. Now, here is my research questions. Okay, 
The current study is set up to address the following research questions. Number one, what is the profile of EFL Indonesian students' vocabulary knowledge? And what is the difference between students' academic words and their cohorts? And then the last one, is there any correlations between academic words and students' cohorts? Okay, what is the purpose of the study? From the research questions about, uh, this research aims to uncover vocabulary profile of EFL Indonesian students in higher education level and to investigate the difference uh, of or development of students' academic vocabulary across three different cohorts. And then later on to investigate the correlation between the students' academic words and their cohorts. The next one is the theoretical framework. First is the vocabulary profile. Vocabulary profile, or sometimes known as a lexical frequency profile, is an empirical measure to distinguish between high-frequent words and low-frequent words. The high-frequent words involve the first 1,000 high-frequency bands, or 1K, and the second 1,000 of high-frequency high band, 2K, while the low-frequency words consist of academic words, or AWL, and words that do not belong to any of those three groups, or off-list words. Developed by Paul Nations, Alex Hetfrey, and also Avril Coxhead from the Victoria University of Wellington, the program is available now in nations' websites. In measuring the vocabulary profile, the number of words in each frequency level is converted into percentage all out of the total running words that appear in the written text. So, the profile of the documents or the compositions will become 75% of the high-frequency words, 10%, 10%, 5% of the low frequency ones. And then uh, all of this is entirely derived from a computer based calculation. The second one is academic vocabulary. Academic vocabulary as a part of vocabulary items registers as a low frequency words and or commonly has coverage about 8% until 10% of the running words. At first, the academic vocabulary was identified as a university word list or UWL which involves about 800 words or about 8.5% of the total coverage of the academic text. Then in 2000, a newer list of academic vocabulary was introduced by Coxhead and it was derived from a large number and diverse types of academic text corpora with a total about 3.5 million words. And here we can see in the newspaper, for example, AWL appears for about 5.2%. Uh, and in academic words, uh, or the academic text is about 8.7 coverage. Now, these types of words contains a substantial number of high-frequency words that are commonly used to express ideas across academic disciplines such as art, commerce, law, and science. Now, each of these areas were derived from some smaller sub-areas such as education, history, Linguistics, philosophy, politics, psychology, and and sociolo uh, sociology also, yeah, is into a groups of arts in this case. So, for example, like the words uh, exceed, improve, distinguish, hypothesize are parts or some examples of the academic words, and they are all recorded at the academic word list. From the results, Cox had identified about 570 headwords, which have been widely used in developing teaching materials in English for academic purposes. Uh, interruption, please, uh, Mr. Wayan. Uh, is that okay if we go on directly to the findings? Because you have five more minutes. For example, number one is... Okay, I think uh, okay. we can go to the findings. I mean, yeah. you can drag. Thank you. Uh, pak, pak, Leo, ya, Pak. Bisa langsung di, di forward ke findings, Pak. Coba dicek findings. Geometry, civics, geography, and so on. Yeah, findings. Go back forward to findings. The words. Kalau theoretical itu kan biasanya kita bisa baca nanti atau jika ada pertanyaan nanti kita back to theoretical review.
uh, ya dari sini saja dulu research method pak yang tadi research method Sorry, Pak Leo. Yes, yes, ya Pak. Dari sini Pak. Yang tadi research method itu penting juga. Back, backward. Uh, dikembalikan ada tadi research method sebelum ini. Oh ini Pak ya. Ya, yeah, oke, okay, please. Oke, okay, now in terms of data collection. The fundamental issue of this current study is to uncover the profile of EML Indonesian students in higher education level and to compare as well as to associate with the students' academic words used in their academic paper uh, across their cohorts. Now, by referring the purpose of the study, then a cross-sectional design was employed to, design, uh, to see the difference or, or the development of students' use of academic words across right variables. Uh, and a quantitative uh, method was used to define as a systematic investigations of the phenomenon by collecting numerical data and conducting a statistical, mathematical, and computational uh, technique. Now, this method is known with its strength to provide a more vivid results was carried out by calculating the students' academic words across the uh, their cohorts in this case. Yeah, and then later on there's a correlation of statistical calculations of the students' academic words with the variable. Okay, now in terms of data collection, the main resource of data of this study was derived from uh, EFL Indonesian students' 1,000 word of academic writing. And this writing produced during attending their English for academic purposes and uh, compositions or rhetoric classes. Okay, good. Uh, here is the procedures and also research uh, subjects of the research. To uncover the, the vocabulary profile of Indonesian EFL students, uh, once again, 150 essays from a higher education level of a private uh, university in Jakarta were evaluated through web uh, through the web vocab profile in Lex Tutor, let's say. And then uh, a set of data was derived from the vocab profiling program, such as the percentage of students 1K, 2K, AWL, and off-list words. Besides, some primary data related to the mean, median, modes, and standard deviation scores of the students or the vocabulary profile were also revealed here. And in this study, one-way ANOVA was used to, ident uh, to understand the difference of the students' academic words across cohorts, which is followed by statistical correlations analysis by using person product moment and statement role in order to investigate the, the associations or the correlations between students' academic words and cohorts. Here is the subject of the study. The subject were uh, university students from private university in Jakarta. There were 150 students were selected uh, to represent a total of 351 students enrolled in three different cohorts, 2016, 2015, and 2014. Okay, now let's talk about findings. In terms of the students' vocabulary profile, an interesting pattern was revealed from the figure. And the figure shows that the students with shorter uh, study time tend to use uh, more 1K in their academic writing, while those with a longer study time tend to use more academic words in their academic writing. You can also see uh, actually the trend here to achieve the standard percentage of academic words in academic writing, which is between 8% to 10%. Of their total coverage and this figure shows then yeah the students with a longer study time yeah produce more academic words with the expected percentage okay the second one is the comparisons of study uh, students academic words across cohorts okay here we can see that there's a significant difference or uh, in the students academic words uh, or academic uh, vocabulary across cohorts and in more detail, we can see that there's a significant difference or development from cohort 2016 yeah, 
and uh, up 2014 here yeah and there is no significance the from 2016 and 2015 the same thing 15 and 16 no significant difference but actually 2016 up to 14 they have difference in this case or they have the uh, significant uh, difference in this uh, point okay the next one is the the results of the correlational st uh, study or the correlational analysis it was we can see here then there's a significant correlations also between the students academic words and the scores of their proficiency test according to the cohorts uh, with the correlation value 0 0.254 now, what does this research or the results actually imply or tell us about? Yeah. Oh, so here is the conclusion. There are at least three points that we can conclude from the results. Number one, actually lower level students and students with shorter time rely on using more less frequently used words or 1K yeah, in their academic writing instead of uh, using low frequency words like academic words or technical words or other office words and then the second one there's a significant difference on the students academic words across cohorts reveal that academic English classes academic English program introduced in this school in the certain in this, in this institution uh, shows uh, what you call it a proper track of development yeah i mean that they said that uh, there was an on track to improve the students competence and the last one actually students control of academic words is in incremental in nature yeah it takes time to learn as it is involved not only about knowing a certain word but also semantic aspect syntactic and stylistic aspect and also restructuring aspect so that's all from me. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your attendance. I would like to open and listen for some comments and questions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, uh, we do thank you for uh, Mr. Christian's presentation just now. So uh, we would like to invite you to the question and answer session. Please, uh, for other presenters and participants in this room, if you have any question, please deliver your question by a chat bar or directly lively. We still have five minutes to this session, question and answer session. Of, uh, or later on, if you have any question, you, you, you can, can they uh, deliver a question via uh, email, sir? Yes, 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 definitely, <laughs> Pa. Yeah, because I oh, also right. try to send my paper uh, for publications. If there's kinds of like questions, comments on that, I am very happy to yeah. I mean, answer that. Thank you. Yeah, okay. It may improve also your uh, research. Thank you so much. And uh, I will invite next presenter. Uh, this research has four authors. The first author is Lucy Susilawati. The second author is Gugun Gunardi. The third author is Dian Indira. And the last author, the fourth, is Alfi Chitra Resmana. Uh, would you like to present your presentation now? Uh, well, Mr. Gunawan, I yeah. have also sent the video recording, but the duration is oh, about right. yeah, 30 okay. minutes. If you want to cut it into 15 or 15, 20 minutes, I, I I feel free for that. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, Paleo. Oh, yeah. Paleo. Directly display it. Paleo. Uh, yeah. Nanti saya akan berikan ini ya. Apa? No. Kalau saya akan forward ke ini nanti. Given to me. My yes, name sir. is Lucy Susilawati from Pajajaran University, Bandung, Indonesia. In this good opportunity, I, with my teams, Dr. Gugun Gunardi, Dr. Dian Indira, and Dr. Alvi Chitrarsmana, would like to present 
the result of our research entitled Formal Innovations of Euphemistic Constructions in Sunanese Language. The main reason why we were interested in conducting this research because based on our observations in the field, we found that there are some Sundanese speakers using euphemism constructions in Sundanese language, but they do not use the right uh, speech level of Sundanese language. And the second one is the rare study about the formal innovations of euphemistic constructions. Uh, some researchers from some countries have uh, previously discussed about the local language euphemisms. For example, in 2015, two uh, experts from the Kenya had their uh, analysis about the euphemisms used in Gikuyu, a Bantu language spoken in Kenya, and they focused on the semantic processes of the euphemistic uh, formations. And in 2018, uh, Daud Wahid and Didat from Malaysia had the analysis about the euphemisms in Iban speakers Sarawak, Malaysia, and they focused on the factors of euphemistic use. And the last in 2019, the expert from Philippines uh, analyzed the local language of uh, euphemisms uh, entitled The Use of Euphemisms by Iligenan Society in Iligan City, Mindanao, Philippines. And they focused on the functions of the, the euphemisms. The similarity of uh, the research, the, this previous research, are on the local language analysis of euphemisms. Uh, well, the difference is uh, they focus on the semantic euphemism, euphemistic formations, uh, factors of euphemistic use, as well as the functions of the euphemism, while our analysis is uh, focusing on the uh, in, uh, formal innovations of euphemistic constructions. And uh, Sundanese language is our objects, which is located in the Indonesia country, uh, exactly in uh, the, what is it, uh, Java Islands. And Sundanese speakers, uh, Sundanese uh, language is spoken by the people or the society in West Java province. It is West Java province. And here is the detailed information about the maps of the Java province. And Sundanese uh, language has its uniqueness. Uh, namely, it has a particular speech level, which is called Undak Usuk Basa. And some uh, researchers have long discussed about these speech levels they had some deficiencies of this speech, leisure, uh, speech level. They had three deficiencies, some of them had uh, six deficiencies, uh, and, and even they also have uh, six deficiencies. However, most of them have only three deficiencies. For example, Swessing in 1974 had three deficiencies of the Sundanese speech level with different terms. Namely, the first one is lemus or polite, sedang or needle, kasar or colloquial, and understand in 1993 had also three deficiencies and three different level. The first one is lemus pisan or very polite, Pandengah, or rather polite, and kasar pisan, or crude or free. While Tamsai in 2050 has also three divisions of Sundanese speech level and three uh, different terms, namely bahasa lemas, or refined code, bahasa sedang, or middle code, and bahasa kasar, or coast code. And here is the examples of 
Sundanese euphemisms for death taboo. When uh, we are talking about death, but in an angry situation, so uh, we use coarse code, and the Sundanese words is pai or moda. These two words are very coarse and are not uh, suitable when we use it with others speech level because it would be considered as the the informal uh, it would be considered as impoliteness and when we are talking about death to our friends uh, to uh, the persons who are younger than us so we will use the middle code and the word of death is maut while the third one is pupus ngantunken and tilar dunya these three kinds of birds are used uh, when we are talking about death with uh, the people which are older than us who are older older than us and as well as with teacher or someone having a higher level and it is uh, in the levels of refined code that is why uh, Sundanese uh, speech level is very important in conversations because it is an indicator as a politeness. And uh, about euphemisms uh, or euphemistic constructions, or some people also said euphemistic strategies, have also been long discussed by some experts. For example, uh, Warren in 1992 had two definitions of the, uh, had two constructions of the euphemisms, namely formal innovations and uh, semantics. Aleo, can you please forward to the method of research? Uh, Bisa ke metode penelitian? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, sir. I'll um, try. Namely, okay. analogy, distortions, and borrowing. Ah, ini bisa pak data collection nggak apa-apa data collection dulu yes yeah okay long words okay. and in analyzing this uh, data uh, we apply the descriptive qualitative method and in collecting some data we had the questionnaires uh, and the questionnaire was deployed to uh, 140 respondents and which are divided into two age cohorts namely uh, adolescent age cohort and adult age cohorts which uh, each of them had 70 uh, respondents and these questionnaires had uh, two important informations the first one is demographic information includes name, age, educational level, address, and occupation. And another information in the questionnaire is the question itself, and we applied uh, open-ended questions. Oh, and the questions was created or was composed uh, pass on the situation we created and also pass on the kinds of taboo introduced by Alan and Boris in 2012 includes bodies and effluvia organs and acts of sex disease and death and many and viewing persons after we had distributed these questionnaires to some respondents, to all the respondents, and it's about two or three days we collected it again, and then uh, we divide uh, the questionnaire into two edge cohort, and after that we analyze, pass on. We then analyze it uh, yeah. and, the situ situ pa. and the discussions of the the analysis. Oh, that thank you, Pak. Thank you. Uh, oh, innovations of uh, euphemistic constructions in Sundanese language are found 
uh, there are three kinds of innovations um, from the word device formations. The first one is compounding, derivations, acronym, and onomatope. While in phonemic modification, we found only two formations, uh, namely phoneme replacements and abbreviation, abbreviations. And the last one is phoneme. Well, in word formation device, number one is compounding. As we know that compounding is a combination of two words with two different meanings. And when they are combined into one word, so they have two uh, new meaning. And this is the example. We can see that there is a picture of face, which means, uh, uh, what is it? In Bahasa and Sunda, in Sundanese, uh, it has two two different words. The first one is pikara sepen, which means to make happy, and the second one is Perup, which means face. When these two different meanings of words is combined into one word, so it, it has new new meanings word or pikarisapan perup, which means an annoying person. Okay, that's the examples of the compounding. And the second one is uh, derivations. We found there are seven kinds of derivations in these constructions. Uh, include suffix and prefix. The first one is suffix an. Okay. Uh, when there is the word bulan, which mean, which means month, and this word bulan is added by a suffix an. So it has a new word, it is bulanan, and it has a new meaning which means menstruations or having period. And then the second one is prefix k, uh, prefix ka and suffix an. When there is word berat, which means weight, this word berat is added by prefix ka and suffix an, so it has a new word which uh, uh, of kaberatan which means defecating the third uh, uh, formations of derivations is prefix ga and suffix an okay the example is the word gadu which means possession when the word gadu is uh, added by prefix ga and suffix an so it has a new word of gagaduhan which means human genital and number four is prefix pa and suffix an for example the word lawang lawang means door when the word lawang is added by prefix pa and suffix an so it has a new words of Palawangan, which means female genital. And the next one is prefix uh, ki and suffix an. Uh, example is the word kitu. Kitu means something like that. When the word kitu is added by prefix ki and added also by suffix an, so it has a new word of Kikituan, which means sexual intercourse. And number six is prefix P and suffix N. And the examples of the word is Yarios. Yarios is the root word, uh, which means speaking. And with uh, when the word Yarios is uh, added by the prefix P and suffix N, so the word carios it becomes picariosin which means annoying persons and number seven the last uh, derivation is a suffix naan and suffix na this is special ones because there are two suffix in one word for example the word larang which means forbid 
when the word larang is added by suffix an and suffix na so it has a new words of larangan na which means human genital and the next word formation device is acronyms we have the examples of BAB which is the acronym from buang air besar it means in English is defecating however this acronym is not derived from Sundanese language but it is a loan word from Indonesian language and the last uh, word formation device is onomatop it means that pe people in Sundanese language is uh, Sundanese in phonemic modification we had to finding uh, there are phoneme replacements and abbreviations in phoneme replacements there are some changes in vowel chains consonant chains as well as vowel and consonant chains the example of vowel chains we can see that there is the vowel of a is changed into o yeah, which means breast and the consonant chains of J is changed into Y which means though it is uh, indicate as the swearing word and then the vowels of E and consonant K are changed into vowel O and consonant s which means vagina and in abbreviations there are two kinds of abbreviations the first one is vowel and consonants omissions and the second one is abbreviations of consonant and vowels into number well let's see the vowels and consonants and consonant omissions there are two vowels a here which are omitted or which are uh, abbreviated into uh, mm and k also omitted so there is also double m here so mm means vagina and the abbreviations of consonant and vowels we can see that there are two, cons uh, two vowels hey, Paleo, can, can you please uh and forward to the uh, and one conclusion please m. so this uh Leo? maju uh, conclusion. maju conclusion. maju maju bread. conclusion itu chapter akhir Uh, ini juga tak tunjukkan Pak yang result and discussion dalam table ya dari sini saja. Oke okay, dari sini ya. Oke okay, Pak. Okay. Set. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, another result and discussions is on uh, the most derivation. As I told you before that the most derivations, uh, the most complexions of uh, uh, created by uh, the respondents is derivations and the most uh, taboo kinds of taboo used in derivation is disease and death which accounted in 24 frequency or it's about 67 persons well uh euphemisms construction based on edge cohorts according to Ravina and rofika 2020 politeness is determined by four things the first one is religions psychology culture and social status and age cohort is included in social status and this is the analysis of the formal elevations of euphemistic construction based on age cohorts we can see that from the kinds of taboo now number one it is bodies and effluvia adolescents have more variations than adults okay namely there are five variations 
Derivations is about 33%, acronyms it's about 10%, onomatopoeia 31%. Okay, Would you please forward to conclusion, please? Then, conclusion. Paleo, Maju, Maju Paleo. And for the adult, there okay, is only three. The construction. Uh, from this analysis, we have four findings, and it can be concluded that the first findings have the four word formation devices, namely compounding derivations, acronym, onomatopoeia, and the second one is two phonemic modifications, namely phonemic replacements, abbreviations, and loan words. For the second, for the second findings, there are two most formal innovation constructed by the respondents. It is derivations and mostly occurs in disease and death taboo. And in the next finding, it is the adolescent age cohort which has more variations of the constructions than the adult one. And it shows that they have less knowledge about this uh, Sundanese uh, speech level. Eh, Paleo, stop Paleo. Jadi sudah. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Ma'am Lucy Susila for the presentation. It was very yeah, interesting <laughs> because it's a fresh about you mission in Sundanese language. All right, uh, Bapak Ibu, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any question, please ask. You have five minutes, five minutes more in this question and session, uh, question and answer session. If you have any question, you can deliver your question by writing your question on chat bar or directly deliver your question lively. Uh, can I have a question, Pak Gunawan? And this is from? Yogi. Can I have your name? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah please, I have uh, Pak Yogi. Uh, Pak Yogi, uh, yes. please deliver your question. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Bu Lucy. Good morning, Mr. Yogi. Yeah, I'm a Sundanese person myself, okay. actually. I'm living in Bandung. So it's actually, I'm very impressed to see uh, the research about my vernacular language, which is Sundanese. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the, in the result, um, the variation in adolescent group um, shows that they have uh, less knowledge in terms of the uh, euphemism compared to the you know adult um, population group right yes. so because you know uh, i'm actually in the education area so do you mm -hmm. have any like particular implication about your finding toward the let's say sundanese language teaching for yeah uh, you know for the students so what might be the implications for the sundanese language teaching that's my well, question Mr. Yogi, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, my analysis is about the uh, Sundanese euphemisms uh, based on age cohort. And most of the age cohorts are uh, located in Sundanese, uh, society, Sundanese society in Sukabumi. And then uh, uh, based on uh, educational, what, uh, educational background, right? Question? Yeah, uh, my question is actually uh, you mentioned that in the result the you know adolescent cohort they mm -hmm. have less knowledge right than the adult uh, cohort so does yeah. it mean that you know we need to do something for the Sundanese yes. language teaching right yes. uh, so, we we recommend that uh, formal innovations uh, uh, actu uh, particularly in Sundanese uh, language teaching should be uh, available in the curriculums of Indonesian's uh, educations uh, uh, so that they could use the Sundanese uh, language based on the undak, und, undak usuk basa uh, 
as a speech level incidence language. That's my recommendations to the curriculum, Mr. Yogi. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. Because, you know, I'm particularly impressed with, you know, Sundanese language, my vernacular, okay. even though my background is English. But I consider that Sundanese language actually have like a very diverse and then even more sophisticated layer of language compared to English mm -hmm. because of the Undak Usuk Basa. Yeah. So really hope that Sundanese will keep, you know, will can be preserved, you know, okay. until, <laughs> until <laughs> the, at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Yogi, for the question. Okay, uh, I do hope uh, Miss Lucy's answer meets your uh, uh, question just now, uh, Yogi. Any other question? Okay, I have to uh, stop um, for this question and answer session for Ma'am Lucy. And I go to the next presenter. I would like to invite Mr. Eileen Khan. Are you here now, Ms. Eileen or Mr. Eileen Khan? Mr. Eileen Khan was Leo, ada... on Senon the video, sir. For us, Pak Leo? Yes, sir. I will share screen video by Eileen Khan. Welcome to this topic. The topic today is a spoken vocabulary in the young EFL, ESL classrooms. I'm Eileen Ken. First of all, I want to introduce myself and what I do. And now I'm a PhD student in Tsinghua University and a visiting scholar in UW Medicine. At the same time, before I came in here, I'm an elementary school teacher uh, focused on language teaching for 14 years. And I also have um, two young daughters' mom, and that helps me to discover more possibility from different perspectives. And uh, we will go through the introduction and literature review and uh, methods and the final results and discussion. Hello everyone, my name is Eileen and nice to meet you. And now I'm a PhD student in Tsinghua University and UW Medicine. And because I want to have the more a uh, different experience in the classroom. So that's why I exchanged my learning and teaching experience with the UW Medicine. And so that's why I have the chance to, uh, to share with you about my research. And of course, I really appreciate that the uh, university gave me this chance to share it with each of you. And today my topic talk about the spoken vocabulary in EFL and ESL classroom, especially for young learners. And um, word lists are getting more important for teachers and students in the classroom. Uh, as appropriate vocabulary lists are essential for teachers to make the correct and right teaching choices, especially if they do not have much time in the whole semester. They need to design all the, curri the curriculum in a very short time. And this word list also gives students from the different backgrounds have the opportunities to uh, communicate with the foreign teachers or to express their ideas with uh, a classmates uh, in the classroom. And it, it is also uh, a belief that the standard validated word lists are more valuable than non-standard word lists. So uh, the list of the spoken vocabulary that appears in the classroom of the young EFL and ESL learners has not been studied yet. So that's why I want to share this research with you today. 
am okay that's c and why do i want to finish this uh, research because um the students in the EFL or ESL condition, they usually receive only a few hours of the input in the target language each. What does that mean? It means that when they go out from the school, they do not have much chances to talk, to read in English. And on the other side, the inefficiency of the vocabulary affects the learners' language output, including their reading task and the speaking abilities. So, what can we do for this situation? And that's the specific aim of my research. So, that's my specific aim of the research. I want to discover the spoken words for young ESL and EFL students. So what can I do? The first of all, I want to uh, develop uh, the English spoken corpus in the time one uh, classrooms and the United States classrooms. And the second, I will select up high frequency words, uh, HFW. And then I will verify those uh, high frequency words with the BNC and COCA spoken corpora to uh, select and collect the appropriate uh, the vocabulary for ESL and EFL students. So therefore, this study identifies the ESL and EFL spoken vocabulary and compares them with the corpus of the contemporary American English COCA and British National Corpus BNC spoken corpora to create a high frequency vocabulary list and explore the uh, characteristics of the spoken language. So um, here are the research questions. The first one, what spoken vocabulary do young ESL, EFL learners and teachers use when they interact in English language classrooms? And the second one, what is the overlap, the ratio between the EFL, ESL spoken words and the COCA and BNC spoken COBRA? About the literature review, we talk about the high frequency vocabulary, the COCA, the BNC spoken uh, COBRA. And about this BNC spoken corpus, um, the data using the study include the spoken BNC 1994 and the spoken BNC 2014. And the second part with, uh, about the COCA spoken corpus, uh, it's a uh, Davis 2008, the top uh, 290,000 word forms which occur at least 20 times in five different texts of the COCA were used in this study. And the third part, we mentioned about the National 2011 that recommended that language second, second language learners learn high frequency vocabulary by having teachers arrange the important vocabulary order in the learning process. So about the research method, um, the vocabulary should be converted into a manageable list. So uh, in the first step to accomplish this goal, the current study, uh, um, the researcher performed a quantitative analysis of the conversation between the teachers and students observing the classrooms and analyzed more than one million words to produce an EFL and ESL word list. Um, okay, just well, we can see the step, uh, step one. And then the uh, I will verify the percentage of this spoken vocabulary word list with the COCA and BNC spoken corpus. And finally, I will narrow down the list 
to create a new manageable list of the spoken words that can enhance EFL and ESL students' language learning. Talk about the research participants. We have two different groups in my study, and the first one will be the EFL classroom. The students in time one possess the Mandarin as their first language, and of course, English will be the foreign language for them. And they have been in an English class for at least two years. And the second um.、Uh, Uh, part will be the ESL classroom. The ESL students in the United States possess the English as、uh, their second language. And what I mean, it means that their、uh, first language will be all different because they came from the different country. So we can see that. And uh, the, uh, they uh, had been in an English class for at least one year. Uh, the data were、uh, obtained by a classroom observation. So I will give you an overview of the classroom situation. The first, the teachers held twenty minutes class for their students every day, and during the class time, the teachers share a topic. The children listen to the story or the topic content, and the teacher ask questions and explain the content of the stories, the topics, and every student will. Uh, take turns expressing their ideas concerning the topic of the stories, and the teachers finally give the verbal prompts so that the students, the children, could contribute contribute to the class discussion. And we go very quickly to the research results. The above research collection process results in two spoken language corpora. And the EFL classroom sample generated four hundred fifty-six thousand for thirty-three four hundred thirty-three words made up of the six thousand sixty thirty-six words, and、mm, that means the different words. Okay, and the ESL classroom sample generated five hundred five thousand and ninety. An eight and ninety-eight words, and they comprising、uh, the four thousand eighty thirty a a hundred thirty-seven words.、Uh, the types means the different words, the distinct words, and the two uh, spoken uh, corpus uh, their、uh, overlap ratio will be seventy-seven,、uh, almost seventy-eight percent. That pretty high.、Um, to determine the universality of the two corpora, the EFL ESL wordlist were compared with the American spoken corpus (COCA) and the British spoken corpus (B and C), and、uh, we can see the table、uh, to show us that、um, significant correlation between.、Uh, The EFL, ESL, and BNC were this. The overlap rate of the EFL and ESL corpus and the BNC were one hundred percent, and the overlap rate with the COCA was seventy three,、uh, almost seventy four percent. The three corpora had a low correlation. Yeah. The research discussion for the research questions one: What spoken vocabulary do the learners use in the English classrooms? And from the corpus of the more than one million words, and the overlap ratio of the spoken vocabulary used in both classrooms were seventy-seven point nine two percent, indicating a small difference between. EFL and ESL classroom, and the second part that participants in different environments,、uh, but they use the similar vocabularies between their spoken words. So、um, it looks pretty high that they they will use the similar words. 
Okay, the third part we uh, talk about the more coverage provided by the list of the spoken words, the more likely the list will help learners understand the English spoken in that context. The discussion for research question two. Uh, what is the overlap ratio between the uh, EFL ESL spoken words and the COCA BNC spoken COPRA? The first part we talk about the uh, BNC and COCA COPRA were used to identify vocabulary items that were suitable for uh, second language learning and teaching purpose. And the second part. Um, the study showed that uh, the, although the vocabulary coverage of the corpus is a key criterion for evaluating high frequency word lists, based on the corpus, the developers of the list of spoken words suitable for second language learners should also pay attention to the learners and teachers' language. That's pretty important. And the additionally, the ESL EFL word list were compared with the COCA BNC spoken language COBRA to confirm that the final list of spoken words were appropriate and relevant for second language learners. So that's uh, pretty good. Hello, I'm Eileen Kim, and it's my honor to present this research to each of you. And I do believe that from this research, you do have some ideas or uh, reflection about your teaching in your classroom or your learning in English. Uh, Leo? So, um, yeah. if you have any yeah. questions, can you just do talk not down to video? contact with me. Oh. By the email. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Eileen Khan, for uh, your presentation. So uh, I have uh, written uh, her email on our chat bar. So uh, for all the participants and uh, um, presenters, if you have any question for her, uh, please. Uh, Deliver a question via uh, via email that I have written on your uh, on our chat bar. Thank you so much, and I invite the last presenter for today for this session. I would like to invite uh, Miss Dwi Solaria for the first author, and the second author is Professor Doctor Hadidi, and the third. Uh, author is Pupum Purnawarman. So, uh, are you here, Miss Dwi or Professor Didi or Pupum Purnawan? Papa? Yes, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Dwi Soria Suharti, uh, uh, Dilijet uh, Pak Didi Suherdi and Pak Pupung uh, as well. Uh, let me okay. share my slides. Please. Uh, good. Good afternoon, everybody. Everyone, thanks uh, for the committee for valuable chance and also my fellow presenters and audiences uh, here i would like uh, our uh, research entitled pre-writing activities using technology enhanced efr writing uh, perceptions for from learners uh, before i present uh, i would like to introduce uh, introduce ourselves. <clears throat> I am associated with Universitas Muhammadiyah Tangerang. And now I'm also studying doctorate at Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. And Pak Didi Suherdi is a professor 
of English Education and Head of Doctorate, uh, Department of English Education, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. And Pak Pupung Purnawarman is a PhD in Learning Sciences, Sciences and Technologies, Instructional Design and Technology. And some of his, in, his research interests are ELT and technology. And uh, this is our points of content. Uh, first, introduction. Second, related theory. Third, uh, methodology. Four, findings and discussion. And the last is conclusion. Uh, I come with introduction. The issues is uh, EFL learners often find themselves not having ideas about writing. Recently, technology is required in enhancing uh, learning process, including pre-writing activities. However, it is not many have studied it. Thus, this study investigated the perceptions of uh, technology enhanced pre-writing activities for EFL learners at one of Indonesia's private universities. And the research questions are, first, how are students' perceptions of pre-writing activities using technology enhanced in learning EFL writing? Uh, second, what are the tools utilized in the pre-writing activities in EFL writing courses? And the third, what are the benefits and constraints faced in using technology enhanced pre-writing activities? And uh, this is the relative theory. Mm. English writing is utilized in uh, the working environment in the EFL setting. Uh, in practice, writing is a language skill rarely pursued after because of the difficulty students face. So the teachers have promoted various approaches. They are uh, the process approach, product approach, and gender text uh, as asserted by Algarabali Al 2015 to overcome these difficulties. And uh, the pre-writing activities is come to uh, give the solution. Here, uh, according to H2005, page uh, 51, uh, he um, divided into three pre-writing activities. First, being motivated to write. Second, getting ideas together and third, planning and outlining. And the theories related to technology enhanced activities, uh, here come uh, first, yeah, uh, come from Lee Hegelhammer, 2013, that uh, technology enhanced education into different learning conditions. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, language institutions are putting forth extraordinary attempts to ad advance the foreign language learning process. And now in uh, the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, the utilization of technology has progressively become a typical component of the classroom. So uh, information technology has drawn English educators' enthusiasm as a foreign language in non-English spoken nations. And the second uh, proposed by Lan, yeah. Lan uh, sorry, uh, proposed by Lan et al. 2015, computer supported cooperative pre-writing for enhancing young EFL learners pre-writing performance. And this, uh, the third uh, proposed by Karim, 2018, technology enhanced mind mapping technique in writing classrooms as pre-writing activities. And also by Zaid 2011, web-based pre-writing activities on college EFL students' writing performance. And this is the previous research. Uh, Z conduct the study entitled the effects of web-based pre-writing activities on college EFL students' writing performance and their writing apprehension. The study was conducted at a university in Saudi Arabia. Results showed no statistically significant differences overall in writing under the three conditions. The researchers suggest teachers involve students in as many pre-writing activities as possible utilizing technology. 
and the second uh, conduct by Lansung Cheng and Chang in 2015 entitled the effects of different computer supported cooperative uh, pre-writing strategies. This study in Taiwan confirmed the effects of different computer supported cooperative pre-writing strategies on the writing performance and English grammar forms of young EFL beginning learners. The, the researchers suggest a technology should be integrated as part of teaching writing to stimulate writing cooperation and motivation. And the last uh, previous study conducted by Karim 2018 entitled Technology Assisted Mind Mapping Technique in Writing Classrooms an Innovative Approach. Karim conducted research. Uh, the results is 90% of participants regarded online mind mind maps as uh, he argued that online mapping and this is uh, a case study deployed yeah, as it can depict and investigate some phenomenon and occurrence in a real situation the participants recruited 75 students from one private university in Tangerang and the instrument the instrumentation a set of questionnaires observation and interview and this is the demography of the students uh, the data shown that the most of respondents are the third year uh, with 84 percent they are primarily female 85 percent their age most frequently belongs to 21st uh, up to 23 years old with 89 percent Uh, the data collection is online online for, uh, format Google form uh, and the data analysis. Uh, here, the study used descriptive qualitative frequency and percentage uh, percent were used to calculate how they perceive EFL writing, uh, main difficulties of writing aspects, technology enhanced EFL free writing activities, and the interviews were to reveal the benefits and challenges found by the students in implementing technology enhanced EFL pre writing activities. And uh, now we come to the findings and discussion. Uh, writing is a skill that often introduce confusion among the other language skills for both students and instructors. So, uh, uh, researchers found this uh, data uh, from uh, the interview. It is in line with Melikova, Skoro Bogata and Safa Di Safa uh, 2018. And it is also found that students argued that EFL writing is the most difficult EFL language skill because they have to decide the main idea and have to know the right words in writing. So it is uh, reflects the process of writing that's, uh, that's proposed by Flower and Hayes in 1981. Uh, that best comprehended as a lot of particular reasoning procedures that writers arrange or sort out during the demonstration of composing. And it is also found that mobile devices like smartphones and tablet computers have allowed the integrating of technology in enhanced education into different learning condition. As it, all, uh, it was also claimed by Sue, Lee, Yang, and Ahmad, that it was evident that digital technology can afford teachers and students alike with a new mobile of tools. And also it is found, it was evident that digital technology can afford teachers and students alike with a new mobile, mobile of tools as also by Ahmad. Uh, the researchers uncovered the students primarily determine uh, the who, what, where, when, why, and how of a topic. It is similar phenomenon uh, noted in other studies by H. Johnson Sheehan Payne Mogahed uh, that stated various exercises in generating ideas or pre-writing activities. And the study reflected the types of teaching learning activities such as readings, movies, discussions, brainstorming, webbing, and outlining as also argued by Wiggle, 2014. Researchers found the, different, uh, the benefits gained by students in implementing technology enhanced in their pre-writing activities. 
students could quickly learn to find ideas about the topic. They could also discuss it through the application such as WhatsApp. In light, in line with the requirement of computer mediated and web assisted technology enhanced composition to renew as a way for altering and assisting the writing process as uh, Ahmad and Zaid did. Despite the many benefits they felt, the students felt, there are also challenges they faced. They thought that sometimes they were confused about how to operate the tools. These findings are in line with uh, what Sokolik found, and that is uh, according to the interview, one student felt lazy to learn vocabulary, grammar, and English writing because confusing how to operate the tools. However, some students experienced no challenges at all in learning EFL writing in the pre-writing activity stage using technology assistance. Uh, the conclusion is our the, uh, the study has revealed that students felt it was essential for generating ideas about the topic before writing. Yeah, they admitted, uh, and they also can discuss the idea through the an application such as WhatsApp, uh, and it helped them to start EFL writing quickly, speedily, simplify their writing. Students felt it is practical and promotes their independence and autonomy. You know, however, they also face uh, challenges, such as being confused about how to operate the tools, having a poor internet, and teachers uh, hear the recommendation. Teachers must be active in motivating their students until they feel it is a pleasure to learn EFL writing using these technology enhanced pre writing activities. And the researchers recommend uh, future research to improve the implementation of technology enhanced activities and investigation into other writing strategies such as drafting and revising students' composition using technology is necessary. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Maybe any questions? All right. I thank you, Ms. Dries Loria Suharti, for your interesting talks uh, delivering about your topic about the EFL and technology. And uh, I would like to invite you all to deliver your question. If you have any question, please ask. We still have five more minutes in this question and answer session. Can I because have a is, question? Uh, you know last presenter. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah uh, I give you time. Uh, Yogi Saputra. Uh, good morning, uh, Ibu Dwi. Good afternoon. Good morning. Oh, yeah, yes. good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm actually cur I'm currently writing a research as well, and it's related to uh, pre-writing as well. But I think I'm using different application. It's called Padlet. Uh, so could you please clarify what sort of application that you use in this research that the students need to use? Is it only WhatsApp, or are there any other applications? And then uh, could you also clarify what you mean by the pre-writing activities uh, that the students need to do? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any else participant or I think just uh, Pak Yogi. Uh, let me search for <laughs> the manuscript. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm. Uh, thank you for the question, Pak Yogi. Uh, may I may I answer, Pak Moderator? Yes, please, because only Pak Yogi has the question right now. Okay. <clears throat> uh, regarding to the uh, application, uh, so our uh, study is only uh, to explore to explore pre-writing activities using technology enhanced EFL writing. And it was found several applications, not, not only WhatsApp. Uh, there are many. Let me let me uh, look for. Sebentar. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> So uh, 
uh, students use online dictionary, Google tools, yeah, and then uh, they use also, uh, yeah, uh, online dictionary, Google Google tools for uh, searching a topic, yeah, uh, that is the pre-writing activities. Uh, before I uh, mention about the, the application, maybe I will uh, convey you what pre-writing activities here. So uh, we uh, draw upon the theories uh, from Wegel 2018 that uh, pre-writing activities uh, comprises the, the, the activities such as yeah provide motivation content fluency language practice such as uh, readings uh, structured language practice readings films discussions brainstorming webbing and outlining adapted from Wegel 2014 and uh, the findings found the students uh, use dictionary online uh, for a structured language uh, practice such as vocabulary and grammarly for the grammar and for readings they do uh, they did a uh, webbing and also watching films before they write their uh, essay and also discussion using whatsapp uh, and most of most of the pre-writing activities are webbing uh, I think that's that's uh, from my uh, uh, for uh, from our findings, Pak Yoga, eh, Pak Yoga, yeah, Pak Yoga. Jadi, Yogi. Uh, so uh, Yogi. we only explored the tools, not uh, particular in uh, one tools. Okay, I see. Thank you so much. So does it meet your question, Pak Yogi? Yes. All right. Thank, okay, thank uh, you for the question. All right. I thank you also, uh, Ms. Dwi, for answering Pak Yogi's question. All right. Uh, I thank you all our distinguished uh, presenters for today and also for all our other participants. And it is hoped that all our recent researchers' findings may be useful for us as the teachers and lecturers developing our learning teaching methods and also for the students, our researchers may, may be useful for them to achieve a high proficiency English skills. So um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for all your participation and cooperation in this first, in this second uh, session, the first Asian EFL journal, Universal Universitas Kristen Indonesia Second Language Acquisition Research International Conference, hosted by English Education Department, Faculty of Letters and Languages and Institution of Research on Community Services, or LPPM, of Universitas Kristen Indonesia, in collaboration with TESOL Asia. You may continue your agenda based on the schedule provided, and I have uh, resent you just now on our chat bar about the schedule. Thank you very much and may you have a great day. See you. Okay, see you, thank you, Pak. Thank you so much. You may leave this room and uh, you may log in next session at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Gunawan. Thank you, Pak Gunawan. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pak. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. My pleasure, I'll see you then too. Thank you, Mr. Gunawan. Lunch time now. My okay. Let me to close the meeting. Yes. Uh, okay. Can I leave this room now, Pak Okay, please. Okay.